My name is Neil Harvison and I'm a cyborg. I was born completely colorblind, so I created this antenna in order to extend my perception of color. The antenna picks up the light frequencies in front of me, so I then can hear different notes for different colors. Red is the lowest frequency of light, so it's a low frequency of sound, whereas violet is a high frequency of light, so it's a high frequency note. The antenna allows me to go beyond the visual spectrum. It includes infrareds and ultraviolets. It's not possible to take it off, it's implanted. So I sleep with it, I shower with it, I live with it every single day. And it's part of me, like a nose or a, an ear. I don't feel that I'm using technology, I feel that I am technology. In 2004, after many correspondence with the UK passport office, my antenna was allowed to appear in my passport photo. This allowed me to be officially identified as a cyborg. I think in the future, many more people will see it ethical to design yourself. It will be normal. My name is Jens. I've had my microchip for six months. We are a growing community of people at the forefront with this technology. For the last few months, we've been able to present our train ticket with this microchip. When we asked the train company to accept chip tickets, we were amazed when they agreed. In the future, I would like to use my chip for traveling on the metro, on buses, and pay for things in shops. When the ticket collector comes, they can just scan the microchip with a smartphone. I commute four or five times a week, so having this microchip makes it a lot more easier for me. I feel like I'm saving everyone time. My name is Sam Kosman. I am the founder of Quake Technologies. Our aim is to revolutionize the ability for human beings to see through smoke. I was exploring a volcano in Nicaragua and had a difficult time seeing through dense volcanic smoke. So we turned to the fire industry with the hopes of finding a solution that didn't exist. So I assembled a team and wound up creating a product called See Through. This product was actually co-created with firefighters for firefighters to save lives. What we do is a very high risk, very dangerous job. When we are fighting a structural fire, 95% of the time, it's zero visibility. The ability to essentially switch on vision is game changing for what we do. This is absolutely the future of firefighting. To be working on a project that has the potential to save lives around the world is very humbling, and we're excited about what the future holds for it. Let's start with Sam Grossman. Already you've uh, seen uh, what Sam has been doing. Um, it's, I, I'll let him explain it better, but it really has to do with being able to see through smoke for firefighters. Now, interestingly enough, some, when we get so excited about some of the technology that is happening right now, artificial intelligence and so on, sometimes we don't solve the problems that are sitting right in front of us, that are everyday problems, that also require a lot of thought um, to make a very big difference indeed. So Sam, I'll just uh, if, if you would just talk about uh, yourself, your company, and what it is that you're doing. Sure. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Kosman. I'm uh, an explorer who ventures into hard to reach places to learn more about the planet. I lead scientific expeditions, and I'm also the co-founder of Quake Technologies, where we're, we've built a product to help first responders uh, see through smoke and improve situational awareness and performance in, in hazardous environments. What have they told you about the difference that it makes? Oh, it's really, uh, they've said it's the difference between seeing and not seeing. It's basically like flipping the lights on in, in darkness. So um, ultimately, uh, our, our aspiration, our goal is to help leverage this product to save lives, to empower the men and the women that are on the front lines every single day, risking their own lives to save ours. BJ Candy, let's hear from you about your, um, your idea and your company. So my name is BJ. Um, my startup is called Decibel.Live. Decibel. So, decibel. Decibel. So we make sensors that monitor environment pollution, and we capture the sensor information on the blockchain so government can, governments can set regulations, and we enforce the regulations in a fair and transparent manner. 
So this is a way really of us across the board, all types of pollution, measuring where we are and what we're doing. Uh, so putting, putting numbers to it. Right, so the thing about pollution is, it seems like uh, it, 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 it's invisible. So we only know about pollution by its effects, right? So when bad things happen, that's when we realize uh, we attribute the effects to pollution. So the challenge is recognizing it immediately in real time. And now if we know that in real time, <coughs> excuse me, we can take actions. And that's, where, that's exactly what our sensors and our smart contracts on the blockchain do. Daphne Kupara. I'm a public servant in the Canadian government. And unlike my esteemed panelists here, the idea that we're here talking about isn't a technological advance. It's a system change for human resources and government. So right now in the Canadian federal government, it can be very difficult for a manager to hire a public servant. The process is long and cumbersome. It can sometimes take up to 12 months. And even after that, the manager may not get the right talent in place. And for the public servant, it can feel a bit dehumanizing to be hired for a job and then be stuck in a box because nobody is looking out for your career and it's difficult to move around government. So what Canada's free agents proposes to do is to put that autonomy back in the hands of the public servant. So myself as a free agent, I have the ability to move across government and work where I want to based on my interests and skills and where I feel I can make a difference. Kevin. So at Mobilize Construction, we're breaking the rules on how roads are maintained and monitored. We install devices or smartphones onto public service buses or taxis, so it takes no additional cost to gather real-time information on road quality. And then in Kenya, we're working with local community members to create jobs for them to fix roads. So road quality, if there's a problem with a road, it can be reported very, very quickly in real time, as you say, and be fixed very quickly. And what benefit um, economically does that have? So, I mean, all of us, we use roads to get here. So roads are the lifeblood of society. So we can transform life as we know it. So in local communities in Kenya and Uganda, we've been able to decrease the transportation costs by half. So that means mothers are getting to hospitals faster, quicker, cheaper. Farmers who are now selling their crops to market are able to earn more income so they can afford school fees. I really mean this, it is transformational. And interesting as well that you would have thought maybe that governments or local councils or whatever would have an idea of the state of the roads, but clearly you're telling them something that they didn't have information about. Absolutely. So the typical story that we found out in roads like you see behind me is five engineers get in the car and they drive. And that's the, that process is time consuming, it's inaccurate, they're writing this down on paper. And in developed worlds, we're using expensive machines that go off, that go off maybe one or two times every year or two, so there's, everyone's driving blind. So really using crowdsourcing in a way, the population, this resource from the population. Absolutely, so I feel like roads are public assets, we all own it. If we increase the value, we're all benefiting. Sam, let's come to you and ask, um, for every product, there has to be a market. Um, so how did you go through working out whether there was a hungry enough market for this? Yeah, well, like I said, the, the idea really originated from a, a problem that I was experiencing as, a, as an ex one of the few volcanic explorers needing to navigate safely to build an early warning system. But after we created this product for ourselves, we, we were quickly... Um, put in front of, of some firefighters who said, actually, this could be really useful for us. We spend so much time um, trying to navigate through smoke-filled environments where you wouldn't even otherwise be able to see your hand. So we thought there might be something to it, and it, it kind of built a, a life of its own. Uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that thermal imaging has been around for 40 years. It's become an indispensable tool for firefighters, but the way it's currently delivered is it's in a handheld system. Uh, and whether you're an explorer or you're, you're a, a firefighter, you, <laughs> you need your hands, you need to climb or you need to hold your hose line, which yeah. is the, your lifeline. And so we wanted to put those, the, the vision system in, in front of the, the, the user, but then beyond that, kind of distill that complex image into something that's much more usable for the purposes of making a faster decision and navigating more quickly. Vijay, again, this question of the market, are you confident that there's a sufficiently solid market out there? Um, How did you sell it to, to governments to say that you, you need to know what this information is? Right. So I think the biggest challenge was not from the governments themselves. It was actually creating a platform where uh, all stakeholders can agree on a set of facts. A set of facts. Uh, these days, we seem to be living in the fake news era. And it's really challenging when somebody, someone says, I didn't, you know, I didn't do this pollution, uh, the methane levels that my factory is creating. Uh, that's not a, and that's as per the law, and the government people say, well, that's not exactly true. You're violating this level. So, how do you bring all these stakeholders 
onto a trust platform where we can agree on a set of facts. And that's exactly what we did with the blockchain. And once we have that, um, the governments were, um, the, we, we started a pilot with The Hague, and they were really interested in taking actions now that we have a trust platform. Daphne, coming to you, I can imagine there may have been a bit of uh, persuading, um, not for employees, uh, but for the government, to see that, that this could be done, that, that, that this could work mm -hmm. as an employment method. Right. But we found that remarkably, even with very little marketing, a lot of managers were looking to deploy talent very quickly and were frustrated with the current HR system. And while as we scale the project, we're noticing that uh, the data that we're collecting from managers and from e free agents themselves tells us that it's a success and that people want more of this. We see higher numbers of um, satisfied employees among the free agents themselves. And from the managers who have hired free agents, we're seeing satisfaction from them as well because they're getting engaged, talented people very quickly to work on projects in a short period of time. So the data really speaks for itself. And I think that's what's helping to really propel the, the program forward. And it, I suppose, in a way, it plays to a current theme, which is that sometimes if you want a job done, I'm thinking of these uh, various apps that we have, um, you can draw on that skill and resource. So in a way, it, there was a societal change going on, and you were able to ride that wave a bit, do you think? Exactly. I think it's, it's almost like a just-in-time solution, but for humans and, and public servants within government. So for the benefit for managers is being able to just pull the talent that they need for the time period that they need and then send them back out on assignment. And then for the individuals, the public servants themselves, they're engaged, they're happy, and they're, and they're high-performing as a result of their, of their happiness because of that autonomy they have. Kevin, how receptive might a government be to being told in bad news about their roads? <laughs> So, I mean, I think we all understand and see potholes every single day yeah. because we all use roads. And I think governments have been very receptive to the information, but I think that's only one half. That doesn't solve the full problem. We need to fix these roads so that community is able to live life as they should. I'd like to just then briefly, in the couple of minutes that I have left, to go through the panelists and say how do they think they might change the world or not uh, through, through their idea and pushing it forward, Sam? No, um the, the concept of, of uh, improving vision for first responders has been around for a long time, and we've taken some incremental steps towards doing that. Um, it, but we're now at a, this incredible inflection point where the technology to really kind of take that quantum leap forward is, is here and now. And so we're taking advantage of that opportunity, and ultimately I think that translates to saving lives, saving lives of the first responders who are on the front lines and, and empowering them to, to do their lives to save the lives of those who uh, they are sworn to protect. VJ, uh, uh, being presented with pollution information is not the same thing as doing something about it, is it? That's true. So I think what we need is um, people need to be aware of uh, pollution as it happens in, in, in real time before uh, something bad really happens. So what we do is what we have sensor network, networks uh, people can use, and they, you know, the, the sensors form a network, um, a mesh network. It forms a bigger mesh network across city blocks, across um, a large towns, or, uh, a large wider area, for instance. And um, that creates incentives or social incentives that forces corporations to be socially responsible, for instance. So that's one of the things that I think people should do, or, or we're trying to do. Daphne, do you think what you've introduced here is going to um, change really uh, the, uh, how efficient a government is? We think that as a movement, yes, that could happen. I mean, the research shows that when you give people autonomy, they're happier, and a happier public servant is a more effective public servant, is a high-performing public servant, and high-performing public service provides better services and programs for its citizens. So we really think that the free agent program as a concept could be could easily be adopted by other countries and other governments. And so we put out the challenge to other countries to say, look, if you want a high-performing public service, if you want to improve the efficiency of your government, then come talk to us because we can, we can help you make it happen in your country. Kevin, how, how much could what you're doing change the world? So half of the world, three billion people live on ro much of the gravel roads you see on the background. So by implementing what we're doing and fixing these roads, we really can transform lives. And I think we're at the inflection point where mobile technology is available. We can deploy this. Smart cities is becoming a reality, both on the urban center, the rural center. And we can really implement and deploy this technology and fix roads for every single person around the world. 
Right now, it's your turn. Um, I'm hoping that you're going to put your hands up, and we'll rush a microphone to you. If you would like, I'd like to hear where it is that you're from and your name and stuff, and your question. Yeah, my name is Jay Collins from Citigroup. Oh, hello. Uh, so a number of you look like you've, you're in either startup mode or SME. Um, how are you finding government's ability to procure you at your size level? Interesting. So these are small companies, um, and can governments interact with small companies effectively and, and with trust and confidence? Anybody want to answer that question? Has that been a problem? Kevin? So as a small business doing procurement, we've been talking with large organizations like the World Bank, UNOPS, UN, and it's extremely tough. Tendering processes are hard. They take time. They take very specific resources. So it's, it's actually been quite tough, but I think the governments are slowly adopting new ways to innovate, to work and collaborate with small businesses. We're currently based in the, uh, we, we work in Cardiff and they have an innovation program. So they're doing a trial, doing a phase, and they're taking this risk willing uh, opportunity to say, let's implement these new technologies. Let's try because it's, you know, if we don't, it might be too late to implement all, and you know, we're going to be behind. Anybody else want to talk about some of the barriers of being a small company and trying to interact with the government? I can talk about that. VJ. So I work on the blockchain. Um, that's one of the buzzwords so these weeks. Where? On the blockchain. On the blockchain. So if, if any of you know about Bitcoin or, or Ethereum, that's, that's the technology we use for storing the sensor information. But um, it seems like the thing about blockchain is, you know, um, that has evolved so fast and so frequently these days, it's that the, uh, the problem is that the governments are catching up. And now we have economies built on the blockchain and governments are doing catch up with doing regulations and policies on, on the networks or uh, on the blockchains that they can't control anymore. So I think uh, what would have been nice is if, they were, if there were policies from the beginning uh, that would help create uh, a safer economy on the blockchain, for instance. I think, um, so that's, some, that's one of the challenges. Now we are having to face with, so with, with the pollution monitoring that I'm working on. Uh, there are essentially no laws on the blockchain, and now we have to deal with uh, you know, governments explaining how, you know, or, or, or bring up, bring, you know, or how do I say this? Explain the blockchain to government officials who make the policies. Uh, the, some governments are open to these new technologies, obviously, that's why we are here in Dubai, but some are playing, you know, like the ones in the U.S., for instance. That's very tough to get into, mm -hmm. and I think they'll lag behind. Yeah, I have a, I've had a similar experience. Uh, so we're, we're obviously making hardware for first responders, firefighters, and such, and um, as for a very good reason that the products that are used by uh, these these rescue workers are um, they're safety products, so they, they have fairly tightly controlled regulatory um, hurdles. And the, the issue is when you're creating a, a next generation product um, and you're, you're applying standards that were set prior to those technologies even existing in the first place, you've, you've immediately created a, a hurdle for yourself to be able to sell to government workers. Um, so, you know, I kind of uh, speak, I would echo that sentiment. I think it's really important to have um, to kind of be looking out at the edge, as, as is being done here, to see what's coming down the pipe um, so that policies and regulations can be set forth such that new innovations can be born out of that. Because if it's not, it can stifle innovation. And that's the opposite of what we want. Any other questions? Yes, please. Just came from, <clears throat> excuse me, just came from Mariana Huffington, who talked about the lack of creative ideas because we're so addicted to our smartphones and that um, it's really hard to have disruptive ideas like you guys have had. So I'm curious about the underlying creativity that you have. How do you foster it in yourselves? And how do you foster it in the work environment so that you continue to have breakthrough ideas like these? It is true, isn't it? I think that smartphones keep us in a particular space, don't they? And you need to sort of free your mind a bit. Was this what you felt, any of you, that you sort of needed to free your mind into a different space to, to develop these ideas? I think certainly with, the, with um, free agents, that's something that has, has almost been like an unintended consequence of it, is that because we've screened these free agents for a set of common attributes, and creativity is one of them, we're unleashing these creative individuals across the public service to kind of seed that creativity in organizations across the government system. And the hope is that over time, those, those ideas and those attributes will 
find their way into the culture of that organization and spread throughout government. Mm. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is partially where I feel like our creativity has come from. I, uh, you know, creativity, in my opinion, uh, is directly translated to curiosity, and, and curiosity is really at the heart of exploration. So exploration could be an engine to driving innovation, which is partially why these worlds have, have intersected for us at Quake Technologies. We venture into places that are rather unknown. Um, we look for problems to solve, and oftentimes, like any proper innovation, you start with one thing and it translates to something entirely different. And I think as long as you're open to that and you, you maintain that level of curiosity around, about the world around you, um, new brilliant ideas can emerge. And as long as you build that culture into your organization, I think it's a really good thing. And I think for me, I'm a really big fan of Google's 10% time, where you allocate time specifically to try something new, to try something different. Uh, you know, in the smartphone you know, culture that we have, turning off the phone, putting on an airplane mode, getting these you know, not getting these alerts and allocating time to spend to try something new, to take a risk, and to fail and to suck. So I think a you know, really easy example of this is spend one hour every single week. So that's four hours a month, 52 hours a year to do something that is completely different. It doesn't have to be exactly what you're doing at work, doesn't have to be anything related. Allocate time, allocate money, and it's okay to lose it. You're getting a really cool, interesting experience out of it. There's one thing I'd like to add. Yeah. I think. There's no shortage of good ideas. What, where the problem is is with execution. And I think that's where governments can help create programs where ideas can be explored. Um, you know, uh, we're set up in The Hague in the Netherlands. And one reason we went there is because the government wants to. There's a separate division that, that like here, unlike, um, like the Innovation Center, you know, try new ideas and try new approaches, that sort of stuff. That's what I would always, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, and there's one other point that I think is worth making, and that is, you know, some of the best innovations that have, that have emerged over the years have arisen out of intersections. Um, having different people of all walks of life, different sets of expertise, um, kind of overlapping, cross-pollinating their own expertise, their own experiences, and, and looking at the nexus there between those respective skills and, um, and I think that's also an opportunity for government to play a role uh, because government touches so many parts of society and in many ways has its finger on the pulse of, of um, what's happening in the world with its own citizens. And bringing people together and really unifying around common goals can really drive and catalyze change. So I think you know, exploring those intersections can be very useful. We have a few more minutes left. Any questions coming? I would say that I, I think from my observation um, in covering business news for a very, very long time, there is a big gap between having what is undoubtedly a very good idea and making it happen. So I'd quite like to ask all you, was there a moment where you, you sort of turned the corner? Was there a point of inflection? What have you brought to this such that you actually got to the stage of making it happen? Any of you first? Well, I think for, for free agents, we, I think maybe we've turned that corner, but it's still always going to be a struggle trying to innovate from within government. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of conversations today, and my esteemed colleagues are, are outside of government, and they've talked a little bit about how difficult it can be to work with this you know, giant monolithic risk-averse government. Um, working from within government has it, its advantages because you know the system a bit better, but it's always going to be a bit of a struggle because governments are necessarily often risk averse. And so you need to ensure that, that you understand the system that you're trying to disrupt before you go in uh, in order to, to ensure that you're, you're not breaking anything, but you're actually improving it. Any other thoughts? What, how have you managed to keep going, all of you, in, in uh, pushing your innovation into the market? Um, Funding, yeah. you know, energy. Funding is always a challenge at the early stage, but you know, one of the things that has really um, pushed me forward is you know, creating this product when I thought it was really going to only affect a few individuals, and then seeing the outpouring, the response from the first responder community around the world we've received just in a few months. I mean, hundreds of emails, maybe even a thousand or more, from firefighters who have lost people that they were very close to because of the inability to see in smoky environments. And when you realize the potential effect of something, the ability to truly transform lives to save a life, um, that can be very, very motivating. So uh, that's what really keeps us going. 
Yeah. DJ, what um, motivates you? So what motivates me? So, um, so I, I live in Calgary, like one hour from one of the biggest national parks. And I always grew up respecting the environment. I love the nature and I wanted to help protect it. And so I went to school, I studied computer science, but I put what I've learned, my skills, and I, what I really wanted to do, and that's why I started with, with the startup, and that's, that's what I wanted to do, is help protect the environment. I think, um, I mean, what drives me is I know I want to leave a better environment for the future generations. I think we all do. And especially with pollution, it's not confined to geographic boundaries. We all share the same environment, and it affects everybody. And that's what keeps, that, that's what drives me. That's my passion. So. Sounds like it is passion and belief, really, that, yeah, that keeps sure. you all going. Belief in your product. Any just final questions? I think we've got one minute. My name is Sahar Rusan. I'm from the uh, Ministry of Finance, United Arab Emirates. Uh, public sector generally is characterized by being rigid and unable to keep pace with uh, technological advancements. And now on the uh, innovation and public services, do you uh, prefer you know, to design a whole government strategy for innovation or to uh, support the individual structure, uh, individual uh, structures to, you know, uh, uh, advance uh, in innovation or to, to produce new things government can make use of. So your question is? In the innovation strategy, is it better, for example, to have a national innovation st strategy at the government level or the government has to support individual structures uh, in yeah. order to, to promote uh, innovation? Yeah. And later on, a government can uh, make use of that innovation in pr improving its public services. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the idea of having a comprehensive strategy uh, as against uh, individual uh, technology or, uh, technologies and ideas that come along. Yes, Kevin. So I think both are definitely needed on a national level to have that strategy to guide, you know, that's the North Star, to guide individual organizations to go out into the community, to talk to entrepreneurs, to individuals, to build these businesses. I think one step further is to get the finance and get the funding to, you know, help these small ideas sprout up. Because like uh, Vijay said, you have ideas, but implementation is where things come and die. So how many people have failed businesses? And I think by, you know, by nurturing and growing these small businesses, these individuals building this resilience, that's how you get innovation to really blossom throughout entire communities. Yes, BJ. Um, so I was going to say, I think it depends on the project. You got to do on a project by project basis. Some of these things are like if, if it's health related, you might want to, you know, not evolve so fast, you know, take your time and consider what's the risk and that sort of stuff. But when it comes to, let's say, um, regular technology, cell phones and that sort of stuff, you might want to work with a startup that's already experimenting, you know? Otherwise, you'll lag behind and, you know, by the time you start or create a, create a policy, the processors will be miles ahead of um, um, whatever people are working on. So it, I think it depends on project by project basis. But having both, like, like you said, uh, uh, that's excellent for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the concept of having a, kind of a dual approach. I think it's important to have to set some guideposts and to have an overarching kind of uh, goal that you're driving towards, but also to have the flexibility to establish those public-private partnerships, which you know leverage the strengths of small organizations that are lean and can move quickly and innovate fast. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessarily a polarizing one or the other type of thing. I think setting that guide and then empowering the, the communities with the resources that they need, as mentioned earlier, I think providing that seed capital early on so you can kind of take that little spark and turn it into something meaningful and mitigate some of the risk that's uh, significant early on. That's a, a role that government can play and has played in the past. I think you look, even in American history, you can see um, you know, in the early days of the space race, uh, you know, Boeing existed, um, uh, Lockheed, these big American companies could have easily, if they were motivated to put, you know, a, a human being on the moon, but they didn't. And the reason that they didn't is because they needed to, to engage multiple parties to as and assemble this kind of collective vision and unleash that collective genius. And I think setting the infrastructure and empowering those um, who have the, that autonomy is an important mix of, of strategy. Yeah. 
Final thought, Daphne, because I think we ought to stop probably. Sure. Well, when I think about innovation within government, I think Vijay had it right. I mean, there is no shortage of good ideas in government, and I think the best people to come up with these ideas on how to make government better are the people that are living it and are working in the public service. But I think they need to be provided with that support to try new ideas, to fail, to start again, and to keep improving on that, those ideas until they can, they can create something really great. With that positive note, though I think we must leave it, thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Good luck to you all.